with that, it is my very sincere pleasure to welcome our speaker, Fabian Bustamante. Fabian is a professor of computer science at Northwestern. He also directs research at Phoenix RTS, which is a startup that delivers real-time. Um, real, um, real uh, help me out here, Fabian. The RTS no, is- Yes, we do real-time streaming. Yes. Real-time streaming, right. there we go, thank you. Yes. Um, appreciate that. Aqua Lab, he also directs, which focuses research on large-scale networks and distributed systems. Fabian has received multiple awards and recognitions, including an NSF Career Award, multiple Google Faculty Awards, as well as the Science Foundation of Ireland's ETS Walton Visitor Award. Fabian's work focuses on computer science and distributed networks, uh, with an emphasis on characterizing large-scale large -scale systems from the perspective of end users, and then designing new and improved systems based on that input. It is my very sincere pleasure to welcome Fabian Bustamante. Fabian, thank you so much for taking time to share your research with us today. Thanks, Alana, that's great. Let me see if I can get this straight. Uh, okay, I will stop you guys from sharing and I will share my own screen, hopefully. Can you guys see this? Yes. And I, okay, good. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you again for inviting me. And I already apologize to Alana for having messed with her schedule. Um, so let me get to this since we have limited time. And of course, I went a little overboard on my slides. So the work that I'll talk about today is a brief inspiration of an idea that we started working with, uh, that is the potential for using network systems as witnesses. And the application of the idea in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. The work of course was done mostly by my students and a former student of mine who at the time was at Akamai. And I'm sure I can get it. There you go. So nothing new. The COVID pandemic has radically altered daily life. Uh, since the late January, uh, January late night 2019, uh, where the first case was reported in Wuhan, it landed in the US if you won in late January of 2020 in the in Washington state. And by March 23rd, every state had reported cases. By early April, um, governments across the country at different levels have started to adopt social distancing measures. Let me tell you a little bit, uh, clarify a little bit what I mean by social distancing, since we all have this idea um, about six feet. So beyond six feet, social distancing is, it refers to a category of non-pharmaceutical interventions that are aimed at decreasing or interrupting the transmission of a virus and by basically minimizing contact between individuals or groups. And things like, you know, that qualify social distancing include isolation, school closures, quarantine, stay at home, things like that. Non-pharmaceutical interventions like social distancing are in general considered the most effective way of controlling the spread of an infection disease. And people believe that they should remain in place in, you know, they used to, uh, in many places, uh, even as the vaccine becomes available. I checked today and about 40% of the world population has no vaccines. And about 30%, 13%, sorry, of the of people in low income country has received no vaccine, no vaccine whatsoever. So there's still room for this. The problem of course, is that these measures are seen in general, are turn out to be very controversial because of the political, ethical and socioeconomic implications that they have. And I think this country knows that well. I believe that one of the key issues with this is the non-obvious link between the compliance with a measure and its effectiveness. It's unclear if the intervention is ineffective or it's just there is a lack of compliance with it. 
health scientists have been addressing this by using model data. They look at aggregated from data, they define a mobility metric based on this, and they use it as a proxy for social distancing. The idea behind it is that when individuals make fewer trips as captured by these phone traces, then they physically interact less. There are quite a few studies that have used this with data coming from Google or small companies that capture things um, such as like um, ads in your phone or you, rather on the web on your phone. But they have some well identified issues with the potential sources and implications of biases that they have. Network systems, the topic of our work, uh, all over the place, from what we call content distribution networks, and we'll talk to you about them in a second, social networks and search engines. Things like Akamai or Lamlight, Instagram or Google Search all over the place. The idea in this work is that they are such an integral part of our daily life that in a sense they are witnesses of our individual actions. We're trying to leverage this using use of demand on these network services as a proxy of social distancing to try to get a new way of evaluating the effectiveness of APIs. And since I know not everybody thinks yes, uh, what I mean by demand on network services are things like the number of search requests or the number of postings in a social network, or as we all know, the number of hours that we watch Netflix when we are locked in the house. So let me first give you a brief introduction of CDN, so Content Distribution Networks, so that the rest makes sense. The content is the content is king on the web, as I say. Uh, there's an increasing demand for this content, and there's an increasing uh, there's a growing expectation from users with respect to performance. This is being captured and you know in different ways by Google's and Amazon and everybody who cares about this showing them a small degradation in performance translating to significant loss of revenue and reputation. A common answer to the demand for content, availability of content, and even the expectations of performance is what is called content distribution networks. The idea behind these companies is they have servers all over the world, replicate the content near the users, and send users to those, those replicas. So typically, there's a website that uh, we call content provider. It's a company like Airbnb. They identify offices that they want to replicate. And rather than having Airbnb serving the content from a server in the back room office, they tag some of that content and they push the content into the CDN. The CDN has servers all over the world and has a mechanism to move this content on demand, this replicated content, and then to pick the best server of all the replicas to which you, to, which, to send users as they requested. Uh, for us, you know, there is a, you know, the CDNs all over the place, they are nearly 99% or something like that of the top 1 million sites, uh, according to Alexa, are all CDNIs. Uh, that means the serve content through CDNs. Akamai, the one that we use, we focus on, um, is the first of the CDN and it's one of the largest ones. It follows a model that is called Deep into ISP. And they, basically what this means is that the servers are placed on the network, deep into the network, close to where you are. In the case of Northwestern, you can find them a couple of replicas in Reach 2020. So that close. They have to host a very large infrastructure with you know, 170,000 servers around the world with you know, nearly 102 of 193 countries. And you know, a thousand, that's more than right now. This is, a, I think this is a, a year old data. So it's probably larger than that at this point. And the content providers that use them include people like Apple and Airbnb, as I said, Fox Sports, NASA, and others. Report, you know, by their own report, 
they capture something like 15 to 30 percent of all web traffic and about 30 million client requests per second. So again, the idea that we're playing with is to use this man on the CDN as a proxy for social distancing. And the way we're going about, and just to give you a high level map, we're gonna first see if CDN demand can be used as a proxy for social distancing. And if we show that this is the case, then we use them, we try to use it to show the effectiveness of different MPIs, social distancing, campus closure, maximum days, and social distancing. Okay. To do this, we use three data sets. Uh, the main data sets that we use include the demands logged from the CDN, this large CDN, the second mile. These are the demands a user put on the CDN, the aggregated across the CDN, and normalized by the global demand. We then use, we also use the mobility data from Google CMR. Uh, Google CMR is a report, a community mobility report that Google released starting, I think about a month or something like that after the pandemic. The data is normalized relative to a baseline of January 3rd to February 6th. And they, it captures, it classifies movements according to six, you know, in six different classes. And they look at the fraction of, move, of movement, of changes of moves in those different classes. So people going to parks, staying at home, going to uh, retailers or things like that. And last, we use the data on uh, infection from the Asian Hopkins University CC, CSSE dashboard uh, that they made available through a GitHub repo. As I said, first we're going to look at CDN demand in relation with mobility and show that it can serve as a proxy of social distancing, and then use this uh, to look at the spread of the disease in the US, the impact of university campus closure, and the interaction between mass mandate and social distancing. We focus in the US and we do this at the county level. And the reason behind this is basically the US has a very like a wide range or had a wide range of mitigation responses and enforcement and intensity of the outbreak that made it very difficult to understand the effectiveness of these MPIs. We focus in a set of months of 2020. So depending on the study, we use different months and this is just you know, for convenience because it's just too large of the asset. And the different parts of the analysis, we modeled them after or revisit some of the work that has been done in the health sciences. Uh, I know SIP about health sciences, so I've been learning quite a bit and reading a little too many papers uh, from the Lancet. So in my attempt at understanding uh, some of the things that were going on. And so the intent was every time I saw a piece that was using model data from funds, we look at ways in which we can replicate the analysis with the data from a CDM. I will see that in a second. Can I, Fabian, may I ask just a clarifying question? I noticed sure. a few months that looked like the summer months were skipped. I'm wondering why that was. Yeah, that, that was that's a, that's a great question. And the main reason is because we didn't want the mobility related to summer travel, uh, assuming anybody had done that, to impact the results that we were looking at, the trends that we were looking at. Thank you. Same happens. I mean, people have ignored the holidays, for instance. Sure. Thank you. So the first thing, as I said, we're going to look at CD and demand as a proxy. And as I mentioned, people have done, uh, they have looked at phone data, mobile phone data, the variety of mobility metric and use that as a proxy for social distancing. Our idea is to use CD and demand instead of that. So what we want to look at is the average mobility across all locations outside of the residence. And this is with mobility captured that way, and then try to compare that with CD and demand. And so we use, as I said, the data from Google, the Google's you know, the community mobility report, and we compare that with the demand that is coming from the CDN. The graph is just one example of the, of the 
counties that we analyze. We analyze 20 top counties based on population density and internet penetration. This is one example of 10 showing a correlation of 0 0.74, very high correlation. And I think the graph, uh, I would say so because I have nothing to do with, uh, as in like, you know, all the them putting the graph together. Uh, it's a beautiful matching between the, of the two lines and red, you see the percentage of difference on CBN demand. And on blue, in blue, you see the difference in mobility. These are two completely different set. Right? So the guy who imposes the demand of the CDN and the guy who is voluntarily giving information to Google about their, you know, their location don't have to be the same. So I have no idea who these people are or how they are related, but the curve is beautiful. And so you can see as the percentage, basically the fraction of the time that the user is spent or the community is spent outside their home, outside the residence, goes up, there's a decrease on the demand of the CDN. And as they stay home, there's an increase on the, on the CDN demand. Notice that on the side, the percentage of difference is, you know, is going to be the opposite. So we find this strong correlation across all the 20 states. The, um, I think the average of this one, the mean of that one was uh, for today, you know, for today country was uh, 0 0.56 uh, with a really, you know, relatively small standard deviation. So this shows that, or that analysis shows that indeed CDN demand could capture this social um, distance in the mobility itself or could be a, serve as a proxy. So the idea was then use this to look at the relation between that and the um, infection spread. For this, what we did is we use, uh, we look at the paper by Badari et al, that in the Lancet, infection diseases, and we try to replicate this. In that paper, what they use was the equivalent to the Google CMR data. And they look at the correlation between that and the infection spread in the counties with the highest cases as of April 2020. We do the same by using CV in the and we find very strong correlation. The graph again is another example of this. I'm showing you just different examples of different counties in the country. In this case, what you see is the growth of infection cases in green. And in, C in red, you see the CDN demand. So when demand goes up, so people stay home, the growth rate of infection drops. And when demand goes down and people go up, the cases, you know, the number of cases go up. The infection rate goes up. So the uh, what you see in the graph, basically, one of the things that I should notice here, and uh, which was new to me, uh, was the we use for this. You have to actually adjust the CDN demand to when the infection case is reported. This is called the lag, and the lag is computed based on the correlation points. You look at the highest, you look at cost correlation, you look at the highest point, you adjust the curve from that one, you compute correlation across the rest. So this is what you see in the curve. And the three years of 15 days is every time that we switch period, we recalculate the lag. Because what the lag that I'm talking about is the lag between when a person gets infected and when the case gets reported. So let me explain this for a little bit. If you stay home, or rather, if you go out and you're infected, you're not going to see the case immediately reported on the records. The way it will happen is you go out, perhaps infected, you, you know, infect somebody else, that person will get sick, eventually will show symptoms three days, five days later. At that point, we'll ideally go and have you know, self-check. When they go themselves check, they have, you know, they have the sample taken, the sample is sent to the lab. The lab has a queue of other tests that they need to check, and then they will send you back a report. Depending on the time of the, you know, on the uh, period of the pandemic, at different times, the labs were taking something like 20 days at one point in New Jersey because of the queue that they had and the number of requests that they had pending. So 
this lag you know, ranges across you know, different, uh, it varies quite a bit across counties and across the time of the pandemic. And it's only captured by this lag that we reevaluate every 15 days. As I say, we look at this for the 25 US counties with the highest cases, following so the same counties that Badar uses, and we find a median correlation of 0 0.71. And were you were you surprised at the strength of that correlation? Yeah, I was surprised that would be one way of saying it. Yes, I was <laughs> so I, I, I was uh, I, I was very shocked. Uh, the I think it was um, less. Uh, self less less of a shock that, uh, that you know now looking in uh, hindsight because I spent quite a bit of time trying to understand how to look at the data. Um, I didn't know anything about lags. I didn't think about lags. The moment I read somebody talking about there is a lag in there and I had to compute the lag, so like oh of course idiot. You, you know <laughs> it's not that we reflect right away, but I had no idea of that. So you know, this is very far away from everything else I do. So I think the process of, you know, because of the process of learning, because it took me a while to figure these things out, I slowly went into, and the data was not you know, thrown in my face in a sense. But yes, it, it, the, the correlation between the CDN demand and the Google mobility again, two different companies and that, and the infection disease is a complete different data set. It's surprising to say the least. This is perhaps my favorite piece uh, of, the, of the analysis. We have we do an analysis uh, of um, school closures that um, for that we look at university um, college towns in the US and look at campus closures. And we did that for November. I can send you the paper, but that's just part of the paper. I mean, there's no chance I can cover all of this. We already, you know, 30 minutes, oh my God. Uh, so I'm gonna just talk about mass mandate, which I guess and is my favorite one. This is done, work that's done, uh, based on work that was done by CDC. Van Dyke et all report in the weekly report uh, on, um, from the CDC, they had this analysis of a natural experiment that was basically done in Kansas. Uh, it's a beautiful experiment, uh, you know, for, in, in a sense, uh, from an academic perspective. The governor in July the 3rd of 2020 passed a mandate uh, requiring the use of a mask in public spaces. Interesting enough, a month before it had passed another law that says in a you know, few words, you can ignore whatever the heck I say when it comes to health policies. Uh, go figure. So what ended up happening is about 80 of the counties ignored what the governor was saying and the other ones uh, comply and some of them actually have a stricter uh, policies than the government uh, dictated. The study by Van Dyke et al. looks at separates between the mandated and non-mandated counties, those that comply with the mandate and those that didn't, and looks at the correlation between uh, the cases per 100,000, the incidence uh, cases for the two, before and after the put in place of the mandate that you can see as a dashed line in there. And nicely show that those that actually comply with the mandate see a decrease in number of cases, while the, those that did not continue, see a continuous increase in the number of cases. They do complain in their analysis that one of the things that they're missing uh, is the confounding factor that relates to the uh, mobility patterns, among other things. So our work was trying to, in our work, we tried to extend the work of Van Dyke Dividing the counties based on CDN demand, and what we did is we separated demand, uh, we divided demand on high and low demand to try to match that graph that you see there because it's a binary graph. And so we looked at that and added this to the maximum date to see separating every county based on if it's a mandated county or non mandated county and it has low demand or high demand on the CDN as a proxy of social distancing again. 
this graph that you see there. Yeah, sorry. Oh, Fabian, may, excuse me. May I jump in for a moment? We had a question from Luis. Uh, Luis asked, did you also have weather information since that can also modulate correlation? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. So uh, we didn't look at weather correlation, but uh, and, uh, I asked, somebody asked me that question before. And uh, so I don't know about uh, Kansas. And the thing with Kansas, since the old counties in the same state, that kind of goes away, uh, which is one of the things about the nice things about uh, looking at a single uh, natural experiment like the one in Kansas, because you're looking at all the counties in the state. They will encounter some of them next to each other. Uh, on the general study, on the rest of the part that they presented, we have counties all over the country. So while some of the counties were in the north with you know, really nice weather, as we get sometimes here in February, uh, others were in California or Arizona. So the range, the weather, you know, basically varies widely across the country. So given the, in the aggregate analysis, I think just kind of like, being dealt with, if you want. Uh, other things like that, that you know, we explore specifically where things like um, education level, political leaning, um, what else was? Income, so a number of things like that, and we could not find any strong signal. Mm. So when I need to go back to his political leaning, because the one, that one I believe it is there, but I didn't see it. Right, and then... Uh... So, mm -hmm. Fabian, a, a follow-up question here is also, um, can uh, Luis asked if CDN could be a predictor of where cases are going, is that correct? Yeah, that's a funny one. Um, can you use this for prediction? It, it, because you have this lag uh, that I was talking about before, I think, in a sense, it acts as a predictor. And you know, say if you see an increase in demand, the increase in demand is probably immediately, right? So, and if there's a lag, let's say of eleven days, so you know there's going to be an increase in cases in eleven days. Um, now, from there, which is, you know, I think that's a, that's just a fact. From there to say, can I use this as a signal of what's coming? I'll be more cautious because of confounding factors like the one we were just talking about, including the one that he pointed out. Right, it's a different thing when I look at a single country, at a single county, that when I look at the aggregates of all the countries, as these factors kind of normalize that. So the graph in here, um, as I was saying, uh, this is the one on the bond is very close to the one from Van Dyke and it's showing you the number of confirmed cases per 100,000 uh, in non-mandated counties, so the counties that ignore the mandate, and they have low demand, so people are supposedly out and about. And you can see, like, the, the, the trend not just continues, but it actually goes a little bit up. Uh, this low before and after, it goes from 0 0.12 to 0 0.19. When the mass mandate comes in place, and this is what uh, Mandak was showing, you see a drop on the, um, basically almost like a flattening of the curve. This is uh, counties that are mandated, so comply with the mandate, but have low demand, so people are still moving around. The curve is almost flat at 0 0.05. Right? This, this is not exactly what Van Dyke is showing. And this is the thing that we're trying to figure out how to separate the impact of the mask itself from social mobility. To look at that, you see this bottom graph that is the combination of mask mandate and social distancing. So the two of them actually turn things around. They're not just flattening the curve, they're going to a negative 0 0.71. So these are the counties where there is a mass mandate in place and people are staying home. And you see a nice change from 0 0.33 in this low to minus 0 0.71. This, uh, as I said, I love this because mainly because I love the natural experiment that has nothing to do with it. It's not my experiment. This is a, a five by Van Dyke. It's a gorgeous experiment. Uh, so, 
summary, the work that we're trying to do is in a sense is trying to bridge approaches. Private work has looked at the impact of the pandemic on networks and systems. This is on my field. The thing that our community was worried about was basically can the network handle the load? And I found that boring because of course, in general, we can handle the load, no big deal. Uh, well, at least that's what ended up finding. The health scientists on the other side were looking at the aggregate mobility data to try to evaluate the effectiveness of MPI. But they already pointed out the issues that, that we have with using mobility data from cells, from cell phones. So what we were trying to do is combine in looking at the demand on the network system to evaluate the effectiveness of the MPI. And the thing that I'm curious about, and just need somebody to do it with, uh, a new student for this work, uh, is what other places, other problems can network systems act as witnesses? One thing that is kind of like nagging me because I think it's a very interesting one. I learned that uh, when people study mobility of uh, communities, for instance, people live in Venezuela because of the poverty and the repression. The way that that is a study is by, you know, people self-reporting that they have moved to another country. It seems a bit ridiculous. Everybody has a cell phone. And when you move, you move with your cell phone. So could one use that kind of data, you know, again, the same network system as witnesses of human mobility to understand migration, for instance, or migration patterns. I don't know what else is there, but this is the kind of work that, you know, I'm interested in looking at. I think it's inevitable. Um, we have spent most of our life, uh, my community, looking inward, uh, seeing how to improve our systems. And we have done a very good job at that. And now our systems are all over the place. And so maybe it's the time that we turn around and see how we interact with society, what impact does it have, and you know, what can we tell about it? And that is that. Oh, Should I stop sharing? You. Thank you very much, Fabian. Um, we welcome uh, questions on this exciting research. I, I have a question. Um, where did, where did um, you come up with the idea um, for this research? Uh, seeing if CDNs can, uh, you know, be representative of, of mobility and where, I'm just curious, where, where did that evolve from? Oh, uh, so this three, four answer. Uh, in, at the beginning of the, of the pandemic, the program manager from NSF uh, that we work with uh, sent me a mail, sent me, are you sending something to this call? It was a rapid you know, NSF call uh, to look at the interaction between network systems and you know, how the pandemic was impacting us. And I said, of course, I have no idea what the heck I was going to do, but you know, what the program manager tells you, you should send a proposal, you send a proposal. So I, <laughs> you know, called a former student of mine and we, we started brainstorm. And so immediate response from, you know, everybody you talk to was, oh, we shall see if the internet will handle this, uh, which is a valid point. And so we, at least in, in my conferences, we've seen like three or four papers looking at if Netflix could handle this, uh, how Facebook will see this how the networks around the world with you know, experiences like your providers, AT&T and company. And I was like, that's boring. It's gonna be boring. Uh, you know, it's gonna handle that because it's going to be, you know, the way the systems work is you over provision uh, for growth because you see a continuous growth, so you over provision for the growth. The only thing that will happen is that we will be seeing the growth that we expected to see next year, next week. That's gonna be it. And yeah, that's exactly what happened. And so this was like, okay, what does the growth tell me about? And that's how we came about this idea. Thank you. That's that's great. I see Luis has joined us and I'm, I'm hoping to make this seamless, Fabian. I'm having some technical difficulties on my end. Yeah. Andy's helping me out with uh, sending along questions. Luis, um, I think he's unmuted you. Did you have a follow-up question? Yeah, uh, Fabian, great talk and uh, really great work. Um, but 
Thanks. I it, it's it's really I, I understand the point of um, how the CDN not being uh, generally possible to say oh it's a predictor of the future with you know we are 15 days ahead or something ahead because as you point out one of the issues with the data is when it gets reported and when it gets reported depends on so much right in in a place in which everything is screwed up you may be a long time a long delay between when the test is made or the person's ability to go to the test so there are lots of things that are are going on in there but i think that it would be um it, it could still be something that would be interesting to to monitor in uh, in some kind of reliable way. And, and I, I'm thinking about the the advantage of what you are doing versus, for instance, something like the the Google flu approach. Right, the Google flu approach was looking for search terms, but there was sort of a, a kind of feedback loop in that, right? Oh, the yeah. Google flu indicator is saying there are more flu, people go and search, and this kind of creates a, a, a feedback loop that actually destroys the signal. Uh, but in your case, it's not about search behavior, right? This is about what you are doing as a response to you being sick or wanting to move less. So I think there are less risks in there of it being um, um, subject to these kind of feedback loops. And I, I, I wonder if there is a way in which um, it would be possible to have some kind of monitoring system about demand for these things that would pay, maybe be given at, at uh, county level and it would be updated and stuff and and you know I, I think it would be a very interesting system especially considering where we are going with with uh, with testing again and an absence of of sort of surveillance uh, which to me is very worrisome because again it's like we are disbanding and and stopping all this infrastructure and supply chain that we need to do these things. And then when we panic, it's like, oh, let's restart everything from the beginning. So, yeah. so having something like that could be really, really helpful. Um, so th that is yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah. the first. No, 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 I got it. Would it be possible I, I, to do something like that? No, I got, I got it. And I think, I, I think you're right about the, um, the distance between the you know, community reaction, the community behavior, and the signal is such that it's very hard to to uh, to mess with it in the way that you were talking about, for instance, the search terms. That does, that, that's absolutely right. The problem that I that I see, or one of the problems that I see with the idea beyond the fact that you now need to convince the Googles and Akamai's and whatnot, can you please? You know, stream the data, you know, some normalized form of that data so that you don't have to worry about exposure and uh, business practices or anything like that. Beyond that, assuming that you get all these issues uh, addressed, the problem that I, the, the thing that I fear, and I guess it's something to test, is the fact that uh, when I look at this, I look at the aggregate of behavior. Mm -hmm. And so I'm concerned about that, you know, to try to make prediction on a specific county based on the demand changes on that one county, you know, when I don't know what the confounding factors, how they play in that place, mm -hmm. you know, how will that impact the prediction? And, you know, with any predictor system, right, the moment that you uh, screw up, then you're gone. There's <laughs> no point to it, yeah. right? Yeah. So, so the, the, I, the, I think that's the good thing and the bad thing about the aggregation is that it takes care of these confounding factors. That, you know, when you do prediction, you will not have them. You know the, the aggregation, I guess. Yeah. Unless, unless I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe there's a way. I don't know. Maybe there's a way that you can look at. Um... I, I think so that the, the short answer is yeah. I think I think it's a cool problem. 
<laughs> I, I, I think there are many interesting that. things in there. Yeah. And, and yeah, I'm yeah, talking yeah. because I'm noticing that no one else. Oh, no, there is a question from Rhys. Yeah, Rhys. Uh, yeah. How did the lag time between CDN and cases change over the course of the pandemic? Yeah, I, I don't know if you can hear me right now, but I was I was going to ask about that. I, I myself look at um, lag time between indicators. Uh, can you hear me right now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, in my research, I look at lag time between indicators like hospitalizations, cases, and as you've prob probably already observed, like that those change based on age, those change based on time. So I'm, I was interested in seeing how the lag time between uh, CDN and cases uh, changed over the course of uh, your research. Yeah, so the, the actually the lag was, uh, and this is you, you saw that in the, I was briefly explaining that those lines on my uh, on the graph. Uh, we saw changes in the lag um, across you know, basically over time and the same county, and of course across counties and across you know and you know throughout the pandemic. Uh, we have a plot in the graph that showed that um, the distribution of the lag and the mean we found it to be about uh, ten days. And the standard division was, you know, about five. So there was quite a bit of variation on that one, but it was it has nice bell shape concentrated around the time. So you we did see quite a bit of change, but it was the uh, you know we kind of gained confidence because that mean was matching what Badarido reported, which was eleven days. I see. Interesting. Thank you very much. Sure. And now that I see that there is no other question, I'm going to ask my other one, which is about the future work. And, and that is really a fascinating topic, the part about refugees uh, and their movement. And, and I, I, I know about this because of family things uh, and related to the difficulty in, in getting good data about movement of people and where they are going and uh, the the need to, to adjust kind of providing resources and, and responding to things. I mean, I'm talking on the positive side. Of course, there is the danger on the negative yeah. side of, yeah. of blocking them. Uh, but I, I know how you feel about those things. So I'm going with the, the right assumption. Um, yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and one of the things that is fascinating to me about that as a, as a just starting thinking about it is this could be a weak signal, right? Because the refugees are a small group compared with maybe the population in many cases. So there is maybe a, a, a need to detect changes in, uh, in um, uh, access or, or, or uh, changes in requests for, for content that have to be sort of more targeted, right? Uh, and it kind of would need an understanding of what uh, some of the refugees would be, what kind of content would they be looking at uh, as opposed yeah, to yeah, the yeah. general yeah. population. But, but it's, I mean, it's potentially in terms of, of helping these communities and, and helping uh, NGOs in providing uh, support, this could be an, a really fascinating thing. So it, it's, have you started thinking about some of it? And... So that, that was, that's exactly that I was going to tell you. This is just, just an example. The, um, the you know, Alana was asking me how we came to this uh, issue in the context of, uh, of the pandemic. And it was really, I don't know about your work, but some of the work that I do, uh, no, let me rephrase. Most of the work that I do is kind of accidental. So you just run into an interesting question and it's like, you have no good answer for that. And I, you know, I go for a run and come back, it's like, oh, let's do this. And so this one was kind of the same. And the, the issue of um, uh, the mobility of people like, uh, you know, like refugees was kind of the same thing as well. Um, I was in Argentina and there is a lot of uh, people from Venezuela who are working there, like engineers and doctors that are driving taxis. Uh, and they run away from Venezuela uh, with this <clears throat> genius that they have. And now we're going to do business with. And so the, um, 
I was just curious about how do you actually know what mobility is? And I just searched a few places and they say that all the, it seems to be all the studies that you see in the, on that domain is based on self-reported mobility, yeah. which makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. I mean, I understand why, because we had nothing else at one point, but it, it makes really no sense. Mm -hmm. Now, what is the right proxy for that mobility? I don't know. Is it, you know, do you use you know, cell phone data? You should use, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, IoT devices that people have attached. You use a demand on the CDN. I don't know. I, it's a, that's a question that I have, and I, I have not explored this. This is something that I'm, like, looking at now. Uh, you know, basically, I need to find somebody to do it with. But uh, that's this kind of, like, very, very early stages. So your questions are like right on target. I mean, like I, you know, you cannot just look at demand because demand is going to be messed with by everybody else who stays in the country. Yep. So you should look at the specific type of demand. You should look at demand for a specific type of devices. Like I know Akamai can differentiate where the demand is coming from, like the type of device. This is a desktop or is a mobile phone. Right? So that would be an interesting thing to like, you know, see, separate that. Or you can look at the kind of content that they're looking at. And so mix, so like the Google flu model with the man. Yeah. yeah. No, it, it's, it's, it's fascinating intellectually, just as a, yeah. a tough problem. Yeah. And, and I think one of the beautiful things is that there, is, there are also some um, really outstanding opportunities to do some good in, in all of these and uh, and it's well I, I i think that if there are people attending the seminar that are interested in this maybe it would make sense to create a group to to think about it and uh um i mean and this is I, I, you, you know this because I, so you and i've been talking for too long uh but the uh, this issue of like i mean i do believe the fact is that we are the network community that understands the networks and systems uh, has not looked at the way in which the systems that we built interact with society mm -hmm. as a whole. Yeah. And the rest of the fields do not understand the network and, you know, and systems. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. there's a fantastic disconnect there that, you know, that creates an open space for, you know, to come out with interesting ideas and, you know, from your, yeah, from, I remember that the first time you and I exchanged email was on that email, uh, you know, the manual email service way back then. Yeah. The misunderstanding of some people in the uh, outside fields of CS, uh, it's shocking. Uh, not surprising because it's a complex field, but it's shocking. And the lack of interest from my community in looking at, the in, you know, at what we do outside or how we interact with the rest of the world, it's also shocking. Maybe it's an opportunity. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, this is a wonderful discussion, and we sh I should stop monopolizing it, uh, even though mm -hmm. we could keep talking for hours. But uh, um, the, I don't know if there is if there are any other questions. I don't see anything else in the chat. So I think it's just left to thank you very much for a really outstanding. Sure truly stimulating presentation. I mean, really, it's, um, as you are saying, these, the knowledge that that is in the field and the data that is being gathered and produced as a result of the field functioning as, as a huge potential for, for providing insight into human activities and, and human processes. And so, so it, it, it's really, I think, uh, a very Nico uh, thing to be talking. And I, I'm really glad in a sense that this ended up being the closing talk because it's so, <laughs> it's, I think it's so representative of some of the things that I, I, I love about the Nico community in terms of what is being done and what we are trying to, um, to impact. So, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Fabian. Thank you. Bye guys. Thank you for the invite. It's a pleasure. Bye bye.